right? Anyhow, so today the title of my message is, It Is Well With My Soul, and inspired by that ham. Chapter 1, starting with verse 1. In the land of us lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen. Yoke of oxen mean there were two, so that's 1,000. Uh, 500 donkeys, and a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. Uh, verse 4, his sons used to hold feasts in their house on their birthday, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting ran its course, Job would make, the, make arrangements for them to be purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice burnt offerings for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. Job was trying to sanctify his kids. We'll talk about that in a minute. But Job, good intentions, honestly, sacrificed for his kids. It doesn't work. I'll explain. Verse 6, listen to this. One day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord. I kind of like that part, where he has to bow down and answer to God. He does. From roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth in it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Verse 9. <laughs> Satan tried to debate God. He, he's so dumb. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hand. Listen to that. Bless the work of his hand. So that his flocks and herds spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. Verse 12, the Lord said to Satan, very well, then everything he has is in your power, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now listen to us. Here it comes. You think you've had a bad day? Listen to this. Verse 13. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest son's house, a messenger came to Job saying, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby. The Sabaeans attacked and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Listen to verse 16. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Verse 17. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, the Chaldeans formed three raiding parties, swept down on your camels and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another servant came and said, your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine in the oldest son's house, when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. Have you ever heard of a wind blowing in four different directions at the same time. Uh, the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them, and they are dead. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. At this, Job got up, tore his robe, shaved his head, fell on the ground in, 
In what? In worship? And said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Verse 22, in all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Can you imagine being hit blow after blow after blow? Did you catch that phrase? While he was still speaking. The first set of bad news had finished before the next set was standing in line. And then again and again. I mean, everything. The, the, the story starts off by explaining what Job had. Because back in biblical times, a man's wealth was determined by his livestock and by the size of his family. And it says that Job was the greatest. Job was loaded. Job had tons. And in a day, it's gone. And Job's response tore his robe, shaved his head. That's mourning. He was mourning. He, it hurt. Job just, oh, thank the Lord. No. He tore his robe, he shaved his head, and fell down to the ground, but in worship. Come on. To most of us, that's unheard of. We, we stub our toe in the middle of the night, or even worse, step on a Lego. And we may say Jesus, but not in a prayerful, worshipful way. This guy, and I love, look at verse 22. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with, he didn't look at God and say, hey God, what gives? Hey God, how can you let this happen to me? Let's go on. Job chapter 2. On another day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came with them and presented himself before him. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming throughout the earth, back and forth in it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? God's bragging on Job there. That's what he's doing. There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil and still maintains his integrity. Though you incited me against him to ruin, to ruin him without any reason. Though you incite. See, in other words, God knew he was getting blamed for what Satan was doing. God knew, even though you incited him against me, yet Job did not sin. And it looked without any reason. Verse 4. Here's Satan again, still trying to debate God. Skin for skin, Satan said. I said kind of like a teenage. <sighs> skin for skin. A man will give all he has for his own life, but stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bone, and he will surely curse you. Then the Lord said to Satan, very well then, he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of, of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores. With painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Then Job took pieces of broken pottery and scraped himself as he as uh, and scraped himself with as he sat among ashes. Can you imagine? So he's covered in sores. He sits down in some ashes, and he's taking pottery and scraping his skin. 
Look at verse 9, the support of his loving wife. Verse 9, his wife said to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. Thank you, dear. <laughs> That's, listen to what Job says. Are you talking like a foolish woman? In other words, what's wrong with you, woman? Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? Job's blaming God for the trouble. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. Verse 11, when Job's three friends, Elphaz the Temanite, Bilad the Shemite, the Sh I don't know what that is, Sorva the, there's another ite for you, heard all the trouble that had come upon him. They set out from their homes to meet together by agreement and go and sympathize with him and comfort him. Verse 12, when they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. They began to weep aloud. They tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads. Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. No one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. How bad were these boils if his friends saw him in a distance and didn't recognize him? How messed up was Job? He had to have been disfigured by these sores for his friends not to recognize him. He lost everything he possessed. Now his health under attack. The support of his wife was not there. <laughs> Curse God and die. I was thinking some... Calamine lotion, maybe? No? Okay, curse God and die. All right. <laughs> and then his friends show up. They sit down with him for seven days. No one says a word. They're there to sympathize. In chapter 4, I'm not going to read it all because I'm going to run out of time and there's a lot I want to share with you. In chapter 4, the friends finally start speaking up. And in essence, what they say is, what did you do to God? Job, you must have done something sinful. Job, you're probably not the guy we thought you were because you've done something so bad that you've brought God's wrath on you. What did you do? This is the counsel of the friends. Instead of saying, hey, man. There's a devil too. Or, hey, man, God can get you through this. No, 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 no. There's a, hey, man, God's mad at you. What did you do? <laughs> God's mad. God's mad. Stinks to be you, Job. God's mad. And after, and they fill his mind with garbage for four or five chapters in the book of Job. His friends... Tell him he must be wrong. He must be bad. And at the end of those chapters, Job finally looks at God and says, Okay, God, what gives? Finally, after everything. Job looks. Now listen, most of us today would sit back and say, Hey, Job has a right. Job, after all that, Job has a right to put his finger in God's face and say, hey, God, what's up? Hey, God. Hey, hey, you have some explaining to do, mister. Well, God had a response for that. Starting in verse chapter 38. Chapter 38, 39, 40, in 41, God responds to Job's accusation. And it starts like this, verse 1 of Job chapter 3. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of a storm. He said, 
Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? In other words, Job, who do you think you are? You're talking to me? Who are you? Okay. He says, brace yourself like a man. You come to me like a man? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you must know. Who stretched its measurings and lines across its measurings like across it? On what were its footings set? And who laid its cornerstones? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. Who shut up the seas behind the doors when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and wrapped and wrapped, I lost my place, and wrapped it in thick darkness, when I fixed limits for it and set its doors in bars. He goes on to tell Job, look at what I've done. My creation speaks for me. And he does that in chapter 39, 38, 39, 40, and 41. He takes four chapters to give his resume and as to say I'm not obligated to answer you I'm God I'm God there's an American preacher he's a, a, actually a Chinese American preacher by the name of Francis Chan and he has a sermon out called the holiness of God and he, the sermon was actually in response to all the people who say when Everything is said and done, and they're standing before God. They're going to go to God and say, hey, God, you have a lot of explaining to do. And he says, the concept is absurd. He says, every person, when John the Revelator found himself in the presence of God, he couldn't speak. He couldn't speak. And he was like overwhelmed with God's immensity. In verse, in chapter 42 Job repents. In chapter 42, look at starting with verse 2. I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You ask me, who is this who obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me to know. Job sat back and said, you're right, God, I'm sorry. Who am I? Who am I? Again, especially in today's society, we, we're such an entitled society, aren't we? Believing honestly we can demand all kinds of stuff. Believing we have the right to demand. We saw it a lot during the pandemic, especially here at the church where we were giving away food. There was a time when Sister Bassadoni had organized these big food things and people would come by and it was amazing how demanding some of those people were and we're giving them free food you know because that's the type of society we are right now we're an entitled society demanding answers but not giving any we demand God has an answer for that and if we respond like Job, verses 7 through 17, in Job chapter 42, God blesses Job. God blesses Job. Now, a lot of people look at this story and they say, well, isn't it unfair of God to play these games? Why would God allow Job to go through what he went through? Why would God punish Job? Well, Jesus answers that question in the New Testament. You don't have to turn there, but look at this. John chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. Listen to this. 
the disciples walked up and they saw a man who had been born since birth. Verse 9. As they went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, uh, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus said in verse 3, listen to this. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus said. This, uh, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in him. So why does this stuff happen sometimes, from time to time? Is God mad? Is God punishing? No, God's giving an opportunity for his glory to shine. Because he will always see us through. Uh, next month, next month, the 22nd of next month, marks two years of my mother's passing. That was one of my Job moments because, you know, my mom had a knee replacement surgery. And the reason she had this knee replacement surgery is she wanted to keep up with her grandkids. And, and we were making all these plans, and she wanted to go to Washington and tour the Smithsonian. And my mom was making all these plans. Yeah, Mom, we're going to do it. You get your brand new knee, and we're going to do it. And... And so she had the knee replacement surgery. It was an incredibly painful. And what ended up happening to my mom was the medications they gave her to help with pain had a reaction. She has real severe sleep apnea. And the medication caused her to go into such a deep sleep that her heart stopped beating. And she passed. And I remember, because I'm telling you, mama's boy, hardcore. Those of you who know me, I'm a mama's boy. And man, wrapping my head around that. And shortly after that, I, I came across this story. It's about a guy named Horatio Spetford. Listen to this. He was an American author that lived in the mid-1800s. He was a supporter of a famous preacher named D.L. Moody. Well, in... 1870, first hardship attacked his life. His only son was killed by scarlet fever. He, had, uh, he was only four. A year later, a fire came and burned up everything he possessed in 1871. Everything he owned was destroyed. What was left was his wife, and he had four daughters. They decided to take a break from supporting the ministry and go on a little vacation to England. Something happened, and Horatio had to stay behind, so he sent his wife and his four daughters on a ship. Well, the ship sinks, and his four daughters die. The only one left it was his wife. And later, he gets another captain, and they're sailing across. He's going to meet his wife in England. And the captain calls him to the bridge and tells him, this is about where the ship went down. And when he got there and he saw that, he went back to his cabin. And this is what he wrote. When peace, like a river, attendeth my way. When sorrows, like sea billows, roll. Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Though Satan shall buffet, though trials shall come, let the less blessed sure control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. My sin Oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but in whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh, my soul. Do y'all recognize that? It is a song. It is well with my soul. That man wrote it after losing everything. Modern day Job. Listen to the last part of the song. 
The Lord hastes the day when my faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back like a scroll. The trump shall be sound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. In other words, just come, Jesus, and everything's going to be okay. That's his mentality. See, how do we respond when garbage comes at us? Because if garbage hasn't come at you, let me warn you again, it's going to. What do you do with it? Do you shake your fist in God's face? Is it an excuse to rebel against God? No, it's an opportunity for you to look at God and say, okay, God, because of you, regardless of what anything else may go on, no matter what the enemy throws at, no matter what my friends say, no matter what my spouse says, if you're behind me, it is well with my soul. I will make it because of you. It is, he said the glorious thing that, If that segment about his sin, you've taken my sin away. What more do I need from you? Because of that, it is well with my soul. Wow. See, as a church, we need to get together when stuff goes south and get on our face before God. And say, God, no matter what I see, no matter what I hear, I'm going to base my walk on what I know. That because of you, it is well with my soul. I can face anything, God, no matter how big, no matter how small, no matter how hard, it is well with my soul. Because I know that I know that I know that I know when all is said and when all is done, God has my back. And because of Jesus, because of his sacrifice, it is well with my soul.